thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining us here this morning. Um, the only thing I ask is that you share this video. Someone out there may need to hear this message, um, might need to, you know, might get a word from the Lord uh, from this message. So uh, please share it. You know, we'll see what, what the Lord does, what kind of seeds are planted. All right, so this morning when it could, we're going to go ahead and continue in the fourth chapter of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. And while you turn there, um, let me just go over quickly some of the things that we covered last week. If you weren't with us, um, if you weren't able to check out uh, online our, our message, my message from last week. Um, last week I mentioned to you that in this first part of chapter 4, had to do with three aspects of proper Christian living. One, general on conduct, and two, specific about sexual purity and brotherly love. Uh, because of time, I was only able to cover the first two last week. And when we did cover those first two, um, within those first two, aspects of proper Christian living, we saw that Paul gave us four reasons why believers ought to live a holy life and abstain from lustful passions. I titled that message, Reasons to Live a Holy Life. Again, it's online if you, need to hear, if you want to hear it. But those four reasons to live a holy life, we learned, was to please God to obey God, to glorify God, and to escape the judgment of God. Well, in today's passage that we're going to be covering, we're going to be looking into that final aspect of proper Christian living, brotherly love. Now, back in Chapter 3, verse 12, Paul prayed this for the believer. May the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone. And now here in these verses that we're going to be covered, he will explain to the believers there at Thessalonica what, it, what that means and what that looks like. And so as we go through these verses, we're going to learn that when Christians behave in a harmonious manner within the church, it's going to motivate us to act properly outside the church in order to be effective witnesses out there in the dark world. And so I've titled today's message, A Harmonious and Honest Life, because that's what these four verses, we're going to be looking at it uh, in these four verses. That's what we're going to be, uh, Paul is going to be speaking on. So before we get into God's word this morning, let's pray and ask him to speak to us. Heavenly Father, <coughs> we are thankful that um, we're all here together. It may not be the sunniest and brightest day, Lord, but this is the day you have made. And we are blessed by it. We're blessed by the rain that you created. And uh, I just pray that we just will look at it instead of an awful, horrible day that we'll see it as a blessing. We'll see just the, 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 the wonder of, of that, that beautiful rain that you created, Lord. And so now I just pray that you will bless this time we're here together, Lord. Um, open up, uh, may, as we open up your word and start reading it, Lord, I pray that you will speak to us personally, that you will speak to us as a church, that you will show us things that we need to know, things that we need to hear. Lord, confirm things. Also convict hearts, Lord, stubborn hearts of unrepentant sin, Lord. 
lives be changed, may hearts be renewed, may relationships be restored. Fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Now as we sit in, sit at your feet, we just enjoy this time together. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. The Word of God says about brotherly love, you don't need me to write you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. In fact, you are doing this toward all the brothers and sisters in the entire region of Macedonia. Stop there. As I mentioned earlier, Paul reminded readers earlier in verse 7 that God hasn't called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Well, here now, we see that not only uh, are we, uh, are believers to have a controlled body, we should also have a heart of love for our brothers in the Lord. Now, there are lessons for Christians that are, can be learned by other Christians or can be learned from other Christians. But other lessons are taught by God to His children directly. These would be the things that almost intuitively seem right for the believer to do. Well, loving other Christians is such a lesson. As I mentioned, we are a smaller church. And so for the most part, I know most of you and I gotten to know you and I know that all of you have a good heart and you are, you know, really looking out for one another. And for the most part, you know what's going on and you are praying for each other. The love is there, but I think it can grow. It can get better and it, can't, and it can grow um, wider and larger. As we grow as a church, it's going to be harder and harder to keep track of everyone, to really know what's going on in everyone's life. But I pray that that love will, again, continue to grow and you know, it will be known as a church that really cares for one another. But again, these are lessons that were taught by God. So here in verse 9, Paul informs the Thessalonians that they learned to love one another and pointed out that God himself had taught them this. He was, he was convinced of this, fact, of this fact by noting how they distinguished themselves by loving all the Christians in the entire region of Macedonia. If you've been a believer for a while, you know that for the most part, there's a real kinship between believers, genuine believers, not the fake ones, not the ones that just utter the words that speak Christianese and, you know, have a, a mental memorization of Bible verses. It's not in their heart, but real ones. Real ones know there is a genuine kinship there, regardless of a person's background, where they live, their social economic status. For the most part, as I said, Christians can relate to other Christians in ways they can't relate to those outside of God's family. So why? Why is brotherly love so important? 
Because I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Because where there is love, there's unity. And where there's unity, there is the Lord's blessing. Not only that, but just as God's love is a holy love, so our love for God and for one another ought to motivate us to holy living. See, the more we strive to live holy lives and imitate Jesus, the more we'll love one another and not sin against each other. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, we're told, Be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us. Now with that in mind, I want you to listen to what Jonathan Edwards said. The more excellent something is, the more likely it will be imitated. There are many false diamonds and rubies, but who goes about making counterfeit pebbles? However, the more excellent things are, the more difficult it is to imitate them in their essential character and intrinsic virtues. Yet the more valuable the imitations be, the more skill and subtly, and, and subtly will be used in making them an exact imitation. So it is with Christian virtues and graces. The devil and men's own deceitful hearts tend to imitate those things that have the highest value. So no graces are no more counterfeit. So no graces are more counterfeit than love and humility. For these are the virtues where the beauty of true Christian is seen most clearly. Beautiful. Be imitators. Be imitators. Now, some of you probably already know this. Some of you are Bible scholars and... You know, some of you have been going to church for a while and have heard this before, but for those who may not have or don't know, there are four basic words for love in the Greek language. There's a word, eros. It refers to physical love. It gives us our English word, erotic. Eros love doesn't have to be sinful. But in Paul's day, its main emphasis was sensual. And this word is never used in the New Testament. Another word is storge, and refers to family love, the love of parents for their children. <coughs> this word is also absent from our <coughs> excuse me from our new testament although a related trans a related word is translated kindly affectionate in Romans chapter 12 now the two words most used for love are phila and agape phila is the love of deep affection such as in friendship or in marriage, but agape love is the love God shows towards us. It's not simply a love based on feeling. It's expressed in our wills. Agape love treats others as God would treat them, regardless of feelings or personal preferences. Now, the word Philadelphia is translated brotherly love. And because Christians belong to the same family, yes, if you are a believer here, we are all in the same family. We have the same father. And because we have the same father, we ought to love one another. 
In fact, we are taught by God, our Father, to love one another. God the Father taught us to love one another when He gave Christ to die for us on the cross. We love, my friends. It says this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because He first loved us. And so God the Son taught us to love one another when He said this in John chapter 13, verse 34. I give you a new command. This isn't a suggestion or, again, a... Uh, Advice. This is a command from Jesus. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are to also love one another. And the Holy Spirit taught us to love one another when, as Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, He poured out the love of God in our hearts when we trusted in Jesus. He made our home, his home in us when we came to believe and trust in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they the ones, they're the ones who taught us to know what love really is. I thought I knew, and maybe there was a time when you thought you knew what love was, when you came to know Christ, I'm sure many of you, your minds were blown away when you realized what love truly means. I know it did for me. It changed everything. It changed how I saw my wife. It changed the way I saw my children. It changed the way I saw my friends, my enemies, other believers. It just changed it all when I knew the Lord taught me what love is and how to love. He's still teaching me. I'm not done yet. I'm still going through that process of sanctification. And yes, it's true, some days are harder than others. Any of you know that? But He's teaching us. He's teaching you on a daily basis how to love. You just have to be open to it. Have you noticed that animals do instinctively what is necessary to keep them alive and safe? Fish don't attend classes to learn how to swim, even though they swim in schools. And birds by nature put out their wings and flap in order to fly. It's nature that determines action. Because a fish has fish nature, it swims. Because a hawk has hawk nature, it flies. And listen carefully, because a Christian has God's nature, he loves. Because why? 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, God is love. Also, keep in mind that if you're a believer, you can never have too much Christian love. You can't have too much of it. Again, going back to chapter 3, verse 12, here in this letter, Paul had prayed that their love might increase, increase and overflow. And we'll see later. When we get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, that God, He did, He answered that prayer. He answered that prayer to the, uh, Paul's prayer for the Thessalonian church. But for us too, our love doesn't just stop. It doesn't end. It increases and it overflows. So that's something that we can pray as a church for. When you're also, when you're at home, something you could pray for this, uh, for this church. 
about that, that our love may increase and overflow. So, on an individual basis, though, how does God cause our love to increase more and more? Increase and overflow by putting us in circumstances that force us to practice Christian love. See, love is the circulatory system of the body of Christ. But if our spiritual muscles aren't exercised, that circulation is impaired. Atrophy, I think, is the word. The difficulties that we believers have If you do have a problem with another believer, another true born-again believer, we we must come to them. We must come to them and reconcile and fix those differences, fix those problems. You see, when believers have issues with one another, those are opportunities for us to grow in our love. Hardest thing to do is to go to somebody that wronged us or that we've wronged and ask for apology. To forgive and to be forgiven. If you feel like you've been stagnant that you haven't grown in love, try doing that. Try going to somebody that you haven't asked for forgiveness for. All of you know there's one person in, in your life that you've hurt, that you haven't yet. You've asked God to forgive you, yes. But have you gone to that person and asked them to forgive you? Or, to, or for forgiveness. I want to grow in love. Do that, and the Lord is going to teach you some great things and it's humbling. This explains why Christians who have had the most problems with each other often end up Loving one another deeply, much to the amazement of the world. (coughs) (coughs) During World War II, Hitler commanded all religious groups to unite so that he could control them. Among the brethren assemblies, half complied and half refused. Those who went along with the order had a much easier time. Those who did not faced harsh persecution. In almost every family of those who resisted, someone died in a concentration camp. When the war was over, feelings of bitterness ran deep between the groups, and there was much tension. Finally, they decided that the situation had to be healed. Leaders from each group met at a quiet retreat. For several days, each person spent time in prayer, examining his own heart in the light of Christ's commands. And then they came together. Francis Schaeffer, who told of the incident, asked a friend who was there, what did you do then? We were just one, he replied as they confessed their hostility and bitterness to God and yielded to his control. The Holy Spirit created a spirit of unity among them. Love filled their hearts and dissolved, dissolved their hatred. When love prevails among believers, especially in in times of strong disagreement. It presents to the world 
to the outsiders, those outside these walls who don't understand what's really going on here, an undisputable mark of a true follower of Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus, only through the Holy Spirit, can we find that place where we can, again, forgive others and be forgiven. Again, think back when you weren't a Christian or a believer. What would you do when someone wronged you? Go after them, right? I thought you were giggling because you know I'm right. Yes, you would go after them. One way or another, right? Avenge, revenge. As believers, when you became a believer, the Lord taught you something different. The Lord taught you it's not the way to go. So, again, if we want the world to see what the church, what Christians are really all about, start by just showing them what forgiveness is. Again, an undisputable mark. Undis- when we love one another, it's an undisputable, undisputable mark of a true follower of Jesus Christ. Now, you'd think that at this point, after these two verses that I just read, that Paul would once again just be content with this and take another moment, another opportunity to thank God for them. But because he desires so much, uh, desires so much that they keep on loving one another, in the next two verses that we're about to read, he will urge them not to be satisfied with their past performance. He wants them to understand that their love for one another will carry them, in, carry them over into future performance. So let's read about that now. Have your Bibles open again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we finish reading verse 10 and then all the way to verse 12. But we encourage you, brothers and sisters, to do this even more, to seek to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, so that you may behave properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. As a born-again believer, your conduct, habits, and yes, your work ethic within the church ought to also reflect itself outside the church. In other words, how you live among the people of the world testifies to the work that God is doing in your life. See, when Paul wrote this, his concern was that the Thessalonian believers would be unproductive members of society and be seen as dependent freeloaders. Now, it's possible that some had become so convinced that the, of the Lord's imminent return that they stopped working, he stopped doing anything productive. They just stopped doing everything. They didn't do anything at all. So he had to address this. Verse 11, he encouraged them to do three things, even more than the love they were already displaying for one another. He encouraged them, number one, to seek to live a quiet, light, a, a quiet life. In other words, not to seek the limelight. Be content, my brothers and sisters, to be the little 
and unknown, loved and prized by Christ alone. A person who is constantly trying to be loud, get the attention, have everyone focus on them, someone who is constantly on the move, is frequently a bother to other people as well as somewhat of a distraction or uh, as well as somewhat distracted from his own walk with God. But a Christian who strives to be at peace with himself and God will be the source of peace to his brothers and to her sisters in Christ. Such a quiet, uh, a quiet uh, person or having that quiet heart, that quiet nature is a practical demonstration of love for others. And again, you're not the focus of attention anymore. And we see that a lot nowadays. People want to get the attention, want to get the want to go viral and get clicks. Be instantly famous. That will do anything and everything, just crazy stuff, just to get that 15 minutes of fame. Oh yeah, my video went viral. Even Christians too do and say some pretty crazy things just to get that attention. To be the first one to say something about somebody. To react to something, a mistake another Christian made. That's not leading a quiet life. I understand that that comes from unbelievers. But as a Christian, again, this verse here tells us, verse 11, to lead quiet lives. It's okay to just be in the background. To not be that person that is, well, you know, people are going to know your talents. They're going to see that God is using you. God will bring you to the forefront. You don't need to do it yourself. If it's God's plan, He's going to do it. If you just allow Him to, He's going to do it. Now I try constantly to lead a quiet life. I rarely post on social media and, you know, I, I don't reply to a lot of comments that are made on social. I, you know what? I don't even reply to any more comments. It's just pointless. But it's, it's okay to lead a quiet life. Secondly, second thing he, uh, he encouraged believers to do is well, he says, to mind your own business. It doesn't get any simpler than that, folks. Mind your own business instead of trying to butt into other people's affairs. I guess it's true. The Bible does say that we ought to carry each other's burdens. But only if they're being told to you. If someone tells you what those burdens are, what those issues are, Sometimes they may not even want to tell you. They may just be, a, uh, they just want to generally tell you, oh, hey, you know what? I'm, uh, I'm not feeling well. Can you pray for me? Or my son or daughter isn't doing well. Can you pray for them? It's pretty general, and that's fine. But you don't have to get all into their business if they don't want you to. It's their choice, their prerogative, what they want to say. And again, the Lord will lead them to eventually share what they want to share or how much they want to share. But 
Mind your own business. Again, that's part of just leading a quiet life too. Loving others too, it's, it's, that's part of it. You make a, need to find a shirt that says, mind your own business. Let's wear it up here one day. People are going to ask you, what does that mean? Mind your own business, right? Again, don't be butting into other people's affairs. And again, I know he's speaking here to the Thessalonian church, the Thessalonian believers, but this also applies to every believer here today. And thirdly, to work with your own hands. In other words, be self-supporting. Don't be a parasite or a moocher sponging off others. Before I go on and explain this verse here, I know that some aren't able to. They can't work. And, and for one reason or another, and that's fine. This is speaking to those that are able to work, that can work. Now, this, you know, if you can't work, well, again, it's, the Lord knows it's between you and Him what you can and can't do. Sure, He's gifted you and, ta- and give you talents to do certain things and possibly to, to make a little bit extra income, but, you know, uh, that's between you and Him. And these are people that are self-supportive or that are able, willing bodies that can work. The reference also suggests that many here, perhaps most in the church, came out of the working class. See, at the time, the Greeks deplored manual labor and relegated it to slaves as much as possible. But the Jews... They valued it. They saw it as a blessing. And it is, my brothers and sisters, it is a blessing. It's not a curse. As some people will mislead you to believe, it's not a curse. As Christians, we should view manual labor as something good and something honorable. God gave Adam work to do in the paradise. It's the toil and the sweat of work that belongs to the curse, not the work itself. Church, brothers and sisters, anyone able and willing to work with his hands demonstrates his love by being willing to to by being willing to humble themselves or himself or herself to provide for his own needs so he doesn't depend on others but provides for himself but provides for their family this is especially true if you have a family if you have small ones Men, if you're lazy and think you could just make money by making videos on YouTube or Twitch or whatever it may be, playing video games isn't what we're talking about here. Going out there and working. Going out there again. Uh, learn a trade. Learn how to, you know. I know a guy that I worked with that on down, a lot of down, these downtimes that we had, he just would whittle. He had to make these little figurines with just a piece of wood that he found from a tree out there and just whittle a, a little figure. I think he mentioned that you know, he wanted to sell the, or he was selling these items on, 
I think on Facebook or whatever. But that's how he made a little extra income after he retired. He learned to play the guitar, learned how to play an instrument. You know, there's got to be something out there you can do. You can make a little bit of in extra income, but again, provide for yourself. Provide for your family. Especially if you're a Christian. Don't be lazy. It does say in the Bible, if you don't work, you don't eat. Keep that in mind. Paul then states in verse 12 that the reason he encouraged such behavior so that you may behave properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. Doing these three things, mind, um, mind, uh, leading a quiet life, minding your business, working with your hands, wins the respect of non-Christians and it also glorifies our God. Love of this kind is appreciated by everyone. In addition to that, this kind of behavior also wins the respect of your fellow brother and sister in Christ, of Christians. People do appreciate those who don't take advantage of them, who are constantly and regularly asking them to borrow money, knowing full well that probably won't pay it back. Now, I'm not telling those that are lending this money that not to do it. It's up to you. Again, it's, it comes from your heart. Do it. I'm speaking to those who are constantly asking for money, knowing you can't pay it back. If you want to win the respect of other Christians, if you want to win the respect of your fellow brother and sister, can don't take advantage. Don't take advantage of just because they, they, they go to church and they read their Bible. wrong. It's not love. Paul here seems to be discouraging the Thessalonians from expecting financial favors from the brethren simply because they were fellow Christians. And by saying this, he was advocating personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. <coughs> this, my friends, is a manifestation of mature Christian love for one another. Now, in this passage, we learn that as Christians, we must first love one another before we can effectively attract the world, become members of the community of believers. Just as musicians practice privately in order to be ready for a public performance, we also need to learn to live harmoniously with one another in love and then demonstrate that love to the public outside the church. If the church isn't truly loving, isn't truly a loving entity, acting out of God's love in Christ for humanity, then those outside the church will never glimpse that love and be attracted by it. In the first part of this chapter, Paul also showed us, the first eight verses, Paul showed us, well, actually, verses 1 through 12, Paul showed us how practical Christian walk really is. The obedient Christian will live a holy life 
by abstaining from sexual sin, by not wanting anything to do with the things that are going to defile his body, her body. I mentioned that last week. Bodies are temples. When you know that, when you understand that, as a Christian, you don't want anything to defile that. That's how you begin having a holy life. An obedient Christian will have a harmonious life by loving one another. An obedient Christian will have an honest life by working with his hands and not meddling with the affairs of others. Having an honest life. When unsaved people see Christ magnified in this kind of life, in this, in this kind of a life, they will either oppose it with envy. Man, I want that. I want to have that kind of love or desire to have it for themselves. Either way, whether they want it or envy it and, or they desire to have it for themselves, God is glorified. God is absolutely glorified. So now as I close this message, maybe some know about this love, have seen it displayed. You don't understand it. Maybe your neighbor, maybe a family member, maybe your wife, maybe it's your child has displayed this love towards you and you see it. They try to share, share with you why they have this love and you still don't understand it. Let me tell you, Maybe, it could be, again, I don't know the exact circumstance, but if they told you it was Jesus, let me tell you what Jesus did for them. He died on the cross for their sins, and he paid the penalty that we deserved for all the horrible things that we did, all the horrible things that you did. And they asked for forgiveness there at the cross, and they were forgiven. The message, the good news, my friends, God wants to forgive you too. There's nothing that you've done, nothing that you've said that He will not forgive. you've blown it and walked away he wants you to come back he's there waiting with extended arms to embrace you to bring you back you know that story of the prodigal child the prodigal son well, he's like that father just welcomed his son back and that's what he wants to do with you but again, there may be some who just want to be, who know that, who know that uh, the love is there, it's within reach. They just don't know how to do it, what to do, how to reach out for it, how to obtain that forgiveness. Well, that's you. I'm going to lead you to the cross and. Uh, I want you to be able to, to pray this prayer that I'm about to say. And, but I want you to pray with all sincerity, with all your heart. Not like, like, don't look at this as a way of free ticket out of jail, out of hell, or whatever. No. The Lord knows your heart and He wants that sincerity from you. So wherever you're at, Wherever you may be, if you're at a safe place, if you're driving, just pull over on the side of the road. With all your heart, pray this. 
Lord Jesus, I know and I admit <coughs> that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. And I'll believe that you died for all of my sins. And that three days later, you rose from the dead. I completely, wholeheartedly repent for my sins. And I confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me. Fill me, overflow, just until it overflows with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me, teach me, comfort me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, reach out to us. If you want to lead you into your next, help you in your next steps of you. Christian walk. If you're here locally, we want to invite you to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel here in the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. Friends, I hope and pray that this message spoke to you. That reading the words or hearing the words that came out of God's word it, it, it touched you. Live harmonious with one another and live an honest life. Uh, be blessed. Be salt and light wherever you may be. And we look forward to covering this last section of chapter 4 next week with you all. Be blessed. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.